presidential press conference from the New State Department Auditorium, Washington, D.C., May the 9th, 1962. Afternoon. I have one uh, announcement, statement. Because uh, mail received at the White House and by members of the Senate indicates that a great number of people have been badly misinformed concerning one feature of the pending tax bill, I want to take this opportunity to set the record straight on our proposal to collect taxes which are due on dividends and interest. The paid advertisements and circulars financed by the Saving and Loan Associations who have made uh, great profits in recent years and paid very little in taxes, I think something like five and a half billion dollars while paying seventy million dollars in taxes, by banks and others have led many people to believe, one, that this is a new tax or a tax increase, two, that it will take money unjustly from honest taxpayers. Three, that it will create a mountain of red tape, costing more than it will bring in. And four, that it will harm the elderly, the widows, and orphans, or others on low income. Not a single one of these charges is true. This bill simply proposes to collect taxes on dividends and interest income in the same fashion that it has been collected on our wages and salaries for the past 19 years. This is not a new tax. It has been on the books for years. Those recipients of dividends and interest who already pay their taxes will not be affected in any way. Those whose income is too low to be subject to tax will not be affected, for they can exempt themselves from withholding by a simple statement. The only ones affected will be those individuals who are not now paying the taxes they owe on this income, either through neglect or for some other reason. That is tax evasion. Tax evasion of $800 million a year, which must be made up by other taxpayers who pay their tax. And it should be remembered that about 80% of dividend income goes to fewer than 7% of the taxpayers whose income exceeds $10,000 a year. In short, defeat of this provision will not help older people with small incomes who would be either exempt from it or could file each quarter for a prompt income by filling out a simple slip at the post office or bank, as is done every year by those who are involved in withholding. It will help the defeat of this bill only those whose evasion of present taxes is costing every honest taxpayer dearly. More enforcement, more education, more electronic brains cannot do the job. But withholding, as we have seen for the past 20 years, will treat all taxpayers fairly. And this country has prided itself on being willing to bear its heavy burdens honestly. And here's $800 million in taxes, which have been in the books for years, which is not now being paid, and which must be made up by every other taxpayer, particularly those particularly who find themselves, uh, their wages withheld and uh, on wages and salary. So I'm hopeful that uh, those who oppose this bill, particularly savings and loan banks, who have benefited so greatly, that they, uh, who have not been paying their taxes of almost any kind, and who wish to defeat the bill because it does place a just burden on them, and uh, who wish to defeat it by misinforming so many millions of people, I hope they'll start to send out the correct record. President. Yes. The newspapers in Detroit and Minneapolis have been closed by a series of strikes for about a month now. The unions, or some of the unions involved, have been taking turns in calling these strikes one at a time and shutting down the newspapers or keeping them shut. And I wonder whether you would comment on these strike tactics and whether this blackout on news in these two major cities affects the general welfare and the public interest of the country to a point of, of being a matter of national concern in your frame of reference. Well, uh, if you're, uh, the last part, uh, there's nothing in the, these, a strike of this kind that involves national emergency uh, legislation uh, 
But, uh, of course, any newspaper strike is unfortunate because it affects not only the people involved on the paper, but it affects uh, the whole community, the distribution of news and business. My understanding that on these strikes, uh, federal mediators have been involved in attempting to be of assistance. And I, uh, this matter was brought up to me this morning, and I discussed it with the Secretary of Labor, Mr. Goldberg, who said he would be glad to be of any use that he could if uh, the parties felt that uh, he could be helpful. And uh, I'm hopeful that a speedy solution can be reached. And it seems to me, uh, as I've said on several occasions recently, uh, these responsibilities must be borne by the parties. Uh, this is not matters, these aren't matters which can be settled by government edict or uh, that uh, should be. But uh, I am hopeful that these and other matters can be settled and Secretary Goldberg would be glad to be helpful and the federal mediation is already on the scene and has been for some time. Yes. Uh, perhaps in this connection you would uh, comment for us on the uh, press in general as you uh, see it from the presidency. Perhaps it's uh, treatment of your administration, uh, treatment of the issues of the day. Well, I'm reading more and enjoying it uh, less and, uh, <laughs> and so on, but uh, I have not uh, complained, uh, nor do I uh, plan to make any general uh, complaints. Uh, I just, uh, I read and talk to myself about it, but I don't uh, plan to issue any general uh, statement of the uh, press. I think that uh, they are doing uh, their task as a, a critical branch, a fourth estate, and uh, I'm attempting to do mine, and uh, we're going to live together for a period and then uh, go our separate ways. <laughs> yesterday's election results insofar as they affect your administration, the primaries? Well, I've been pleased at the results of the last few days in uh, Florida and Texas. Does the, you, have, you have in the past endorsed some candidates in, in primaries where there was opposition. I endorsed uh, Congressman uh, Fassell and Senator Smathers at the dinner in Miami. I think those are the only fights which uh, I took in an active uh, part in in the primary. Well, I was thinking of Hale Boggs, too, but that's not important. Uh, well, it is to Congressman. <laughs> <laughs> I, what I meant. Yes, that's right. I understand. I understand. Does the administration have a favorite in Texas? Between no, I, uh, I don't know whether endorse is the proper word. I spoke as highly of Congressman Boggs as I could because I don't think, uh, because my opinion of him is that high. Uh, but in the case of uh, Texas, it seems to, I was pleased that both candidates who had been attacked uh, for their connections with the administration did very well, but they're electing a governor in Texas. This is a decision for the people of Texas. I'm sure they would resent any outside interference and just an attempt to talk from Washington about who should be governor of Texas. They're very qualified to make a judgment, and I'm sure they'll make one which uh, suits them. Mr. President, uh, uh, my problem concerns the uh, negotiations with the Soviet Union over uh, uh, Berlin. Uh, uh, Chancellor Adenauer, as you know, uh, uh, has been critical uh, in recent days over both the proposal for a 13-nation uh, uh, access control uh, for organization, also over the idea of the exploratory talks. <laughs> Uh, in themselves. Uh, uh, do you contemplate any, any uh, change of signals in view of uh, the Chancellor's uh, objections? To no, I don't think, uh, at least from what I can gather, and it's not uh, easy, I don't think uh, that uh, that would be a correct uh, interpretation of the German government's position as of this time. As my understanding is that they are interested and uh, support our exploratory talks on the access authority. What has concerned them is the makeup of the access authority, and this has been, since this matter was brought out into the public uh, some weeks ago before the Athens meeting, this has been a subject of discussion between the two governments. So I place that in one category. The access authority itself, which has been before us really as a suggestion for many months, is not uh, in controversy. It is the organization of the access authority, the relative power and position of the various members of it, which has been the subject of uh, some uh, uh, exchanges, which isn't quite natural. It's not easy. The United States is attempting to carry on negotiations for several powers, and all of them have different ideas how it ought to be done, and uh, we have to attempt to coordinate it and at the same time present a position which has some hope of working out in a peaceful way. So I put that as one area. Now, on the talks themselves, we have never 
had any uh, statement from uh, the German government or Chancellor Adenauer that these talks should not continue. These talks are going to continue. There has, uh, as I understand the Chancellor's statements, and I think it's worth reading his entire speech in order to understand exactly what he means and not fragments. He's not very optimistic about these talks. And in fact, he quoted Secretary Rusk as saying that he did not uh, believe that these talks, uh, given the positions of the two parties, that these talks uh, would produce a fruitful result. And maybe they won't. And we have never said that they would. And we have never expressed high optimism about them. I think his press, one of his members of the Foreign Office today said that uh, they support the talk, but that uh, the Chancellor was concerned that there was undue optimism. We have never been unduly optimistic. But we believe that there should be a continuation of these talks. From everything that was said at Athens, from everything that's been said before, everything I've heard in the last two days, the German government supports the position that we should continue the exploratory talks. And I believe we should. No country has done more than the United States in the last 12 months to strengthen our military forces in order to protect our commitments. But uh, the, we hope in calling up 160,000 men, adding billions of dollars to our defense budget, which was not done by many other countries who speak uh, with vigor now, uh, I would uh, feel that the purpose of it, we hope, is not to uh, fight a nuclear war, but to establish an environment which permits us to have a useful exchange. As Winston Churchill said, uh, it's better to jaw jaw than war war, and we shall continue to jaw jaw and uh, see if we can produce a useful result. We may fail, but in my opinion, uh, the effort is worth it in these very, uh, when we're dealing with such dangerous matters, and when we've seen the history of this century when statesmen and leaders and others have brought about failure and brought about war as a result. So we're going to see what we can do. President. 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 Uh, last February at a news conference, you told us that the ceasefire was becoming frayed in Laos, and in the event that it was broken, it could lead to a very serious decision. Uh, I wonder, uh, Mr. President, now that uh, the ceasefire has been broken, and if efforts should fail to reestablish it, would it cause a reexamination on the part of the United States towards its policy there? Well, we are concerned about the break of the ceasefire, and as you know, the State Department, the Acting Secretary of State, the Assistant Secretary of State today, met with Mr. Ambassador Dobrynin this afternoon. We've already uh, indicated to one of the co-chairmen of the British government uh, our great concern about it. Uh, our ambassador in uh, Moscow met with uh, the uh, Foreign Secretary of the Soviet Union, Mr. Gromyko, we do believe that, uh, and have said from the beginning, that the negotiations should move much more quickly than they have. The longer this rather frayed ceasefire continues, the more chance we will have of the kind of incidents we've had in the past few days. That's why we were hopeful after the meetings at Geneva last summer and fall that the negotiations between the parties involved would take place last fall and we could organize a government rather than trying to continue to hold lines which in some cases are exposed and which are subject to this kind of pressure. So that that has been our view. The longer it goes on and the longer there is not an agreement on the government, the longer some groups uh, stand out from these kind of conversations, then the more hazardous the situation becomes. On the particular incident, however, it's a clear breach of the ceasefire. We have indicated it and we hope that uh, the Soviet Union uh, which uh, is committed to a policy uh, based on the statement uh, at uh, Vienna in regard to uh, Laos. We are hopeful that uh, we can uh, bring about a uh, restoration of the ceasefire, but we've got to use the time to try to move ahead on our political negotiations. Now, I agree it's a very hazardous course, but uh, introducing uh, American forces, which is the other one, let's not think there's some great third course. That also is a hazardous course, and we want to attempt to see if we can work out a peaceful solution, which has been our object for many months. And I believe that these negotiations should take place quickly. This is not a satisfactory situation today. Mr. President, uh, on another labor management issue, there's a matter of some concern in Northern California. The uh, construction industry there may face a general shutdown because of the dispute between employers and the uh, laborers union. Uh, the Employers Association appealed to the administration for help some time ago, and uh, 
that there's been a strike spreading during this time. Have you personally concerned yourself with this, or do you? I'm not aware of the appeal. Uh, in, in what way is the appeal made? Uh, the federal mediators are there. In what way is it suggested? It was an appeal they addressed to the White House, sir, and it has gone as far as the Secretary of Labor. And what is the uh, suggestion that they want? What do they want us to do? Uh, they simply want some form of help from the administration. Well, what do they want us to settle it? I, don't know. I think that I want to point out that, as I said to the Chamber of Commerce and, as, and President Wagner of the Chamber of Commerce said, labor and management should settle these matters by themselves. We cannot settle labor management disputes across the country unless they involve uh, those areas where there may be a great national basic industries. But we cannot go from city to city unless uh, uh, we're going to change the whole pattern of labor management relations and you get in then to wage and price setting, which we are opposed to. So that uh, uh, we are attempting uh, in, uh, to set down general guidelines in as effective a manner as we can, which we hope will govern these negotiations. And I would hope that they would have an effect upon the construction industry and the, its employees, as well as upon other industries. And this, I know that the Mediation Service is involved in this. I know the Secretary of Labor in this case also is glad to be of assistance in providing his good offices. But this is a free society, and these gentlemen finally have to make their agreement themselves. Now, if it, uh, a shutdown occurs which involves the health and safety, then, of course, uh, it involves the national government. But uh, I have the impression that uh, there's a great desire on every side to settle these matters without the United States government. And, we want to give them a fair opportunity to do that. Mr. President, uh, back to your relations with newsmen. According to a poll released this morning, a uh, large percentage of our people or the people who were polled believe that the newsmen attending and news ladies do not ask you really important questions. I want to know what you think of that, and at the risk of repetition, one of the questions they seem to think was most important, did you have any ideas towards any new steps to ease tensions and promote world peace? Well, we are attempting in uh, two areas which are both uh, critical areas. One, I said, we're continuing our conversations in Berlin. We have attempted in the last two or three days to indicate our concern about the matter in Laos. We are participating at Geneva in the disarmament talks. We have put forward the most far-reaching plan of any administration or the American government ever in regard to disarmament. We have labored for a long time, even to the point of, uh, that's well known to us, to get an agreement on a cessation of nuclear tests. We are attempting to, lacking uh, an accord, we have maintained our military forces so that uh, through that means we can, uh, as I said, set an environment for parleys. And uh, we have uh, supported the United Nations in the Congo and elsewhere which we regard as a very valuable arm in this struggle for peace, and we are prepared to go any distance in order to maintain the peace, providing it does not uh, involve the uh, breaking of any commitments of the United States or involve any diminishment of the basic national security of the country. I think we've overlooked any important questions, sir. I'm sure we have, but uh, I meant the uh, newsmen asking in the you. sense that uh, we are trying, for example, to uh, strengthen the lines for progress. We uh, exchanged correspondence with uh, Mr. Khrushchev about uh, two months ago about our willingness to provide for the cooperation in space. We have supported resolutions at the United Nations, which I believe in, in regard to the peaceful uses of outer space. We've ex thrown our space program open. It's been maintained chiefly under civilian control and therefore peaceful control. And we are uh, attempting on every level, cultural exchanges and all the rest, to see if it's possible in these two different worlds to let them live together without destroying each other. But I think we can always have to do more, and uh, we shall continue to do so. But it uh, really requires a response in order to have peace, and uh, so far we have not been able to evoke a response of sufficient force. Mr. Uh, Mr. President? Mr. President, uh, on the question of the administration's guidelines for wage increases, uh, Mr. Ruther, in his report to the United Auto Workers, said that he disagreed, at least in part, uh, with the guidelines. He said that the principle of tying increases to productivity should be applied only after certain catch-up wage increases. Now, just before you made your speech up there, he issued a statement indicating that he agreed with the administration. Has the administration been in touch with Mr. Ruther, and has there been a meeting of minds on this? 
Well, uh, we've been in touch with Mr. Ruthie, yes. Uh, as I say, I went up there yesterday and I did see his statement. And I uh, thought it was a fine statement uh, that he made, in which he indicated his general uh, agreement uh, with uh, what we are attempting to do. Mr. President, Mr. President, at the time of your controversy with the steel industry, you were quoted as making a rather harsh statement about uh, businessmen. I'm sure you know which statement I have in mind. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> and you wouldn't want to identify, would you? <laughs> yeah. Would I want to comment on it? Yes. yes. Oh, well, the statement which I've seen uh, repeated as it was uh, repeated in uh, one uh, daily paper is inaccurate. It uh, quotes my father as having expressed himself uh, strongly on the, to me, and uh, it, uh, in this I quoted what he said and indicated that, uh, it, uh, that he had not been, as he had not been on many other occasions, uh, wholly wrong. Now, uh, the only thing uh, wrong with the statement was that as it appeared in a uh, daily paper, it indicated that uh, he uh, was critical of, what, of the business community. I think the phrase was all businessmen. That's obviously an error because uh, he was a businessman himself. He has, uh, was critical of the uh, steel men. He'd worked for a steel company himself. He was involved when he was a member of the Roosevelt administration in the 37 strike. He formed an opinion which he... Uh, imparted to me and which I uh, found uh, appropriate that evening. <laughs> but uh, he confined it, and I would confine it. Obviously, these generalizations as repeated are inaccurate, unfair, and uh, I, uh, we, he has been uh, and, uh, a businessman, and the business system has been very uh, generous to him. But uh, I felt at that time that uh, we had not been uh, treated altogether with frankness, and uh, therefore I thought that uh, his view uh, had merit. But that's passed. That's passed. Now we're <laughs> working together, I hope. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any comment on the... Uh, excuse me. Uh, yes, and then I'll... Uh, yes, do you have any comment on the so-called reverse freedom rides, whereby some southern segregationists are attempting to send Negroes north? Yes, well, I think it's a rather cheap exercise in... Uh, uh, you know, uh, this country, people moving every day by the thousands, 25% of our population live in different states in the last decade than they did. There are hundreds and thousands of people coming from one state to another. So that this rather exercise in publicity to indicate uh, if by this man, is, it seems to me, uh, really doesn't merit uh, very much comment. I think he's... There, we have difficulties in every area. We have people who are out of work in every area. We have people who are inadequately housed in every area. And uh, we ought to do better in every area. But uh, he he's, seems to me, uh, as I said the other day, there is no city traditionally that has enjoyed a happier reputation than New Orleans. And uh, that reputation, in my opinion, based on my visit there Friday, is highly deserved. And I would not let one man possibly block it. Mr. President, there have been rumors in print, in and out of sections, that Vice President Johnson might be dropped from the Democratic ticket in 1964. I'd like to ask, do you have any reason, whatever, to believe that either end of the Democratic ticket would be different than 1964? Well, I don't know about what they will do with me, but uh, I'm sure that the uh, Vice President will be on the ticket if he chooses to run. Uh, we are Fortunate to have him before, would again. I don't know where such a rumor could start. He's invaluable. He not only uh, he fulfills a great many responsibilities as vice president, he participates in all of the major deliberations. He's been in the Congress for years. He's invaluable. So, of course, he will be if he chooses to be uh, part of the ticket. Mr. President, Mr. President, <laughs> Mr. President um, it has been the stated policy, as you said earlier, for this government to restrict outer space for peaceful objectives only. Will not the proposed H-bomb explosion 500 miles up jeopardize this policy and objective? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Mr. President. I know there's been disturbance about the Van Allen belt, which, but uh, Van Allen says it's not going to affect the belt. It's his... <laughs> But it is a matter which we are, uh, we, uh, I've read the protests, and it's a matter which we're looking into to see whether there is scientific merit 
that this will cause some difficulty to uh, the uh, Van Allen Dow in a way which will adversely affect uh, scientific discovery, and this is being taken in very careful consideration at the present time. But I, I do, uh, I think that, uh, so that I want you to know that whatever our decision is, that in regard to the Van Allen Bell, it will be done only after very careful scientific uh, del del deliberation, which is now taking place during this past week and will go on for a period. In regard generally, what we are attempting to do is to find out the uh, effects of such an explosion on our security, and uh, we do not believe that uh, this will adversely affect the security of any person not living in the United States. Mr. President, a special emergency panel has recommended a 10.2 cent an hour pay raise for about 500,000 railroad employees, which estimated cost about $100 million a year. You have observed that this, that the board said it would be non-inflationary. Do you believe it would be non-inflationary? Well, I would, uh, the board uh, stated it would be non-inflationary, and I stated that it was my judgment that they should negotiate a non-inflationary statement, a uh, settlement. Now, the railroads have objected to the arrangement and the rail by saying it's too much. The railway unions are too little. I'm hopeful that the parties will negotiate, and uh, we would, of course, be glad to be of any uh, technical assistance we could if we are asked in order to determine the extent of uh, the, uh, uh, what effect it would have on uh, the cost of living. But it was a good board. They made a very flat statement in regard to it. And uh, I think that what is now incumbent is upon both parties to see if they can reach what I would consider a non-inflationary. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Mr. President, there have been uh, various uh, congressional and executive studies in an effort to develop a uniform patent policy uh, covering inventions made under government contracts. And uh, we were wondering if you intended to uh, submit any legislation to spell out a uniform uh, government patent policy. Well, it's a difficult uh, problem because uh, you have to balance off the, the gains on the one hand, at the same time the incentives to companies to uh, spend their uh, own funds in order to uh, develop patents, which uh, will give them a return in other years, so that the, we have some differences in the space agency problem, the Department of Defense, and perhaps another agency of the government. But it is a matter which is being uh, reviewed now by those agencies which are most involved. And uh, if we have any changes to make at the conclusion of that, then I will send recommendations to the Hill. President, yes, President, more fundamental perhaps than the numbers game that's being played between Bonn and Washington over the International Access Authority and how many members it ought to have, there seems to be a sense of insecurity in Bonn at the moment and in Germany generally about the degree to which this administration will support the basic position of no recognition of East Germany, no degree of recognition at all. I wonder if you could define that point just a little bit. How far are we prepared to go? Well, we've never suggested that uh, the uh, access authority, which was a proposal which could have easily been rejected and an uh, and alternate language suggested in accordance with the normal exchange between governments, uh, which is the reason we sent it, uh, it's never suggested that that was uh, constituted a de facto or de jure recognition of the East German uh, regime, which uh, we have not supported because we have supported the concept of the reunification of Germany. Uh, we, after all, go, uh, the East German government, or regime, uh, and the West German government were participants in the same room at the 1959 Geneva Conference. They didn't sit at the table, but they sat in chairs just behind the table. Now, what did that constitute? Uh, there, after all, the East German regime controls uh, now over 90 today, uh, supervise over 90 percent of the traffic into Berlin, and there are these exchanges in regard to that traffic. What does that constitute? I don't think it constitutes recognition, <coughs> and it doesn't by either de facto or de jure. We participate in a uh, Laos convention at Geneva with the Chinese communists in an attempt to work out an accord in Geneva on Laos. We don't recognize them either way, so that what we're attempting to do is to uh, work out a solution which will provide uh, more security for the people of uh, West Berlin because when the difficult times come, it is the United States that carries the major burden and uh, is looked to to take the major actions which will sustain the freedom of the city so that I think we have some rights to at least explore the possibilities of finding uh, 
a better solution than we now have. But in answer to your question, we did not believe and do not believe the proposal that we made constitute a kind of recognition. For example, among the 13, the proposal, there was a West Berlin, which is not a separate government. And there was an East Berlin, which is not a separate government. So that uh, it was an authority, which it might be compared to the Port of New York and not a government, governmental group or a group of government. But these are, this sort of necessity to debate this matter for a month uh, makes it very difficult to carry on any negotiation with the Soviet Union because uh, all of our proposals are on the table and are thought out in public even before they become our official position. So that it seems to me the best thing to do would be to, if anybody has any objection, to tell us, and we have t said from the beginning that in our efforts to reach an accord, we would certainly, we certainly recognize the necessity of maintaining unanimity in the alliance. But I don't uh, know whether this is the best way to uh, carry on these negotiations if these matters are going to become so publicly debated. If this isn't the best solution, perhaps some other way should be done. And we'd be glad to hear that suggestion. But we carry the major military burden. We've enforced and had the major military buildup. 160,000 Americans called up since last July. And uh, uh, it is not difficult to uh, make suggestions and say, oh, well, you shouldn't do this or that. Well, at the same time, uh, some countries do not play as active a role as we've been willing to play in an attempt to work this out. In that connection, sir, I wonder, do you have any theory or any information as to the reason for the agitation, the degree no, of No, I think a lot of it, I must say that uh, I read uh, his Monday speech in which he stated, Chancellor Adenauer, that the most important result of Athens can be summarized in one sentence, the unity of the free West. If you think back to the minister's meeting of NATO in 1961, unless my memory fails me, it was in December, this is Chancellor Adenauer, there the unity of the free people in the West did not look good. And the unity of the free people of the West, I'm convinced, is the best asset of freedom. But he said this, the whole political future in the East of Germany finally depends on the unity of the West. I believe we can be very satisfied with the way this NATO conference went. So I'm, I think that uh, some of this is uh, speculation, which uh, does not uh, serve the cause. Mr. Drew Middleton in the Times was a, uh, made a very strong and article on the work Secretary McNamara and Rusk had done, said that they had witnessed a striking, and I quote, a striking demonstration, both the United States' reasons for leading the West and its ability to do so. So I think we had pretty good unity as of Saturday or Sunday, and I hope we will this Saturday or Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. President, yes, do you care to comment on the voting in the Senate today on the cloture petition on the literacy test bill, whether you think this is possible as a piece of legislation this year? Well, there were two votes. One was on the motion to table, and that was uh, got a rather large vote against tabling. That vote indicates that uh, the members are for it. Uh, that would be very encouraging. I think it was something like 63 to 33 or 4. On the motion, however, for cloture, which would permit us to have a vote on this matter, then the members voted differently. Well, this, as I understand it, Senator Mansfield's trying again Monday, but uh, if we don't succeed, and I, the Senate doesn't succeed, but if the, the country doesn't succeed in, in getting a vote by Monday cloture, then of course uh, there's no use saying you're for it because it won't ever come up. And I must say I find it extremely difficult to understand how anybody can, though I respect Senator Cooper, and I know that his concern is constitutional, and I expect the others who have various things, but I must say this involves the right to vote. And I've seen these cases of people who with college degrees who were denied the putting, being put on a register because uh, supposedly they can't pass the literacy test. It doesn't make any sense. So I'm hopeful the Senate will vote, but, uh, and there'll be another chance on Monday. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you.